Hi, everyone. My name is Jordan Palmieri, a researcher at the University of Washington, working in collaboration with the Carbon Leadership Forum for this training series. This is Module 1, Embodied Carbon 101. This is the first of five modules for an introductory level training about embodied carbon. After watching this video, participants should have an initial understanding of the climate impacts of the built environment, major construction materials and their climate impacts, embodied carbon and why it's important to consider in climate goals, the difference between embodied and operational carbon, some of the social and economic co-benefits of reducing embodied carbon, and then finally, the basic ways that we measure embodied carbon. Let's get into it. Embodied carbon is defined as the greenhouse gas emissions generated from the manufacture, transport, installation, maintenance, and disposal or recovery of construction materials. We measure embodied carbon using a method called life cycle assessment, or LCA, at the material and project scale. Embodied carbon is recorded using an impact category called global warming potential, or GWP, and is measured in units of kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalents. The next training module on life cycle assessment will cover this content in more detail. Let's take a look at when embodied carbon emissions occur over the life cycle of a building project. This graphic shows embodied carbon impacts of a building using the life cycle approach from left to right to represent time. We can see here that greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to embodied carbon, shown in gold, are generated during raw material supply, transport, and manufacturing of construction products. Emissions are also generated through material transport and the actual construction process itself. During the use phase of a building, we see that maintenance, repair, and replacement of materials also contributes to embodied carbon. Finally, at the end of the useful life of a building, greenhouse gas emissions also arise from building demolition and waste processing. I wanna emphasize that for this training series, we're focused on buildings. However, embodied carbon is a term used to represent the greenhouse gas impacts of construction materials used in any application including pavements and infrastructure projects. On CLF's website, you'll find an embodied carbon toolkit for roadway infrastructure, which helps explain these concepts in more detail for infrastructure projects. Generally, the measurement, reduction strategies, and even policy measures can be very similar between both building and infrastructure projects. Now, the reason we're so focused on embodied carbon impacts is because it comprises a large portion of global greenhouse gas emissions. Let's take a look in the next chart. This shows global greenhouse gas emissions by sector. We can see that the industrial sector, again in gold, is the largest single contributor to global greenhouse gas emissions. And when we're talking about embodied carbon of construction materials, most of those emissions are coming from the industrial sector. However, not all industrial products are associated with construction materials. Let's take a look at the same pie chart and break down the building and infrastructure materials. You can see here that the embodied carbon impacts of building and infrastructure materials contribute to approximately 17% of global emissions. This is huge. And one of the main reasons we focus on building materials. Now let's take a step back for a second to look at the global built environment impacts. You can see here that the built environment contributes to over 50% of global greenhouse gas emissions. This represents both a problem and an opportunity for impact reduction. When we break down those built environment emissions again, we're reminded that about a third are from using transportation infrastructure, one third are from using energy in buildings, and the last third is from using and producing construction materials for buildings and infrastructure. Sometimes I like to think about this chart when helping project teams prioritize their time and effort through either government or private projects. For example, if it's a building project, I like to ask, are we spending at least a third of our time and effort reducing embodied carbon on this project? You see, we should be scaling our level of effort on projects in alignment with the relative contribution of carbon emissions from different sectors. So in this case, the chart here directs us to focus at least a third of our time to reducing embodied carbon on both building and infrastructure projects. One thing I know for sure is that we're at the point in our greenhouse gas reduction efforts where we can't ignore any of these sectors because we know that each piece of this pie chart needs to be cut in half by 2030 and reduced down to zero by 2050. 
to address the scale and pace of greenhouse gas reductions needed to combat climate change. This is how things look at a global level. Let's take a look at the impacts at the level of individual buildings. These charts show the results of a recently published CLF study on the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions from 30 newly constructed buildings in California. Here, embodied carbon is shown in orange and operational carbon in blue. Remember, operational carbon is the greenhouse gas impacts of using energy to operate a building. Energy is used for heating, cooling, creating hot water, and plug loads. In the annual chart on the left, you can see a big spike of embodied carbon emissions right when these buildings are constructed, and then the smaller annual emissions from operating these buildings year after year. In this case, those emissions slowly decline due to grid decarbonization in California. You'll also notice a spike in embodied carbon emissions at certain intervals, which represent material replacement over time. Finally, you can see a spike in embodied carbon at the end of the building's assumed 60-year lifespan when the materials are sent to disposal or recovery. Overall, the cumulative impacts of these buildings on the right side of the slide is worth your attention. In this study, over 80% of the building's carbon impacts were attributed to embodied carbon between now and 2030. We can also see that in 2045, embodied carbon still comprises over 70% of the total carbon emissions from these buildings. While this study was specific to California buildings, the message was clear. Embodied carbon matters, especially in the near term, and it must be reduced if we want to meet our climate targets. Using that same California study of 30 newly constructed buildings, let's take a closer look at which materials contribute to embodied carbon the most. In this chart, you can see that concrete and steel were the most impactful materials averaged across all buildings. But finishes such as carpet, partitions, and ceilings also contributed significantly to the average building. One of the findings in this study was that finishes can be quite impactful for certain building types, like multifamily buildings. And we know from past CLF studies of tenant improvement projects that frequent renovations can lead to interior finishes exceeding the structural embodied carbon impacts over the life of a building. Here's a separate study modeling the entire European building stock impacts in 2050 based on a business as usual construction scenario. Once again, we see concrete and steel at the top of the list, but since this study included the impacts of renovation projects as well, we could see things like paint and insulation used during these renovations adding up to very high impacts across the entire European building stock. Overall, the message here is that while it's important to focus on reducing concrete and steel impacts, Conducting whole building life cycle assessments, which you'll learn much more about in module four, is an important step to both understanding and reducing building scale impacts. The final study I'll share on material impacts was of 503 different residential homes in the Toronto area of Canada. The authors of this study found that concrete, insulation, and cladding were the highest contributors to embodied carbon from all the homes they studied. Overall, we see some similarities and differences across different building types and sizes. So now that we've established why embodied carbon is important and which materials contribute to impacts the most, let's talk briefly about embodied carbon reduction strategies. I want to start by sharing some big picture strategies to reduce embodied carbon. Starting at the top of this chart, we should ask ourselves, do we need to build at all? Next. We should utilize existing buildings to meet our needs. If we do need to build new, how can we build smaller to conserve both materials and energy? Next on the list is building clever, or sometimes referred to as building or material optimization. Finally, you could build efficiently as well and eliminate waste during construction and also recover waste at the end of a building's life. These are big picture strategies. And before we dig a little deeper in the next slide, I do wanna emphasize that there are embodied carbon reduction opportunities at every point in a project and for all parties involved. You'll see in the next slide that owners, designers, engineers, contractors, and building occupants and maintenance workers all have a role to play. All right, let's take a closer look at some more detailed strategies. I'm not gonna talk about all of these strategies, but we'll provide a few highlights. During design, we can limit below-grade construction. 
multiple stories of below grade parking and large quantities of concrete can dramatically increase embodied carbon. For material and system selection, choose your mechanical system carefully to reduce the carbon impacts of refrigerants and educate yourself on the variety of low carbon insulation and finishes available on the market. For specifications and procurement, optimize your concrete mixes and utilize EPDs to select lower carbon materials. And as a part of your process on every project, use whole building lifecycle assessment to evaluate design decisions and also identify embodied carbon reductions as a priority on every project. Now, these are just some examples and be sure to check out some of the additional resources presented throughout these training modules and additionally on CLF's website. We've been talking a lot about embodied carbon impacts, and I do want to emphasize that reducing embodied carbon impacts also has the potential to reduce other environmental and human health impacts as well. Let's take a look. Building materials have a direct local impact on ecological and human health. Communities adjacent to manufacturing facilities can be unjustly burdened by industrial pollution. Workers can bear dangerous working conditions or unfair labor practices and building occupants can suffer health impacts from exposure to unsafe building materials. Building materials also rely on global supply chains and are one of the highest risk industries for modern slavery in the world. Without supply chain transparency, we will continue to perpetuate these problems. Although we're focused on reducing embodied carbon in these training series, it's important to know that the way that we measure embodied carbon using life cycle assessment, which you'll learn more about and later training modules also reports the environmental impacts to air, water, and soil through a host of other impact metrics. This measurement system called LCA is one of the best tools available for transparency and can help facilitate impact reductions in a wide variety of areas and is a core tenant to making informed design and material selection decisions. In the next module, you'll learn more about the method used to measure embodied carbon, which again is called LCA. In module three, you'll learn how to apply that method to individual materials using EPDs and then to buildings in module four using whole building lifecycle assessment. For my last couple of slides, I'm gonna cover how embodied carbon measurement is done at the scale of a government, business, or individual. Now, let's start with the government scale. When we look at embodied carbon impacts in the United States over a 10 year period, we see in this chart that about one quarter of all impacts occur from public construction of buildings and infrastructure. Now this is quite large, which is why we see a lot of government procurement policies focused on lower carbon materials. You'll learn more about these policies called by clean policies in module five of this training series. And although these impacts are large, they also present a large opportunity for impact reduction through public sector spending. In fact, the public sector purchases about 50% of the cement produced in the United States and about one fifth of the steel produced. So based on these impacts, we have a lot of individual governments taking a closer look at their purchasing practices to help identify where they can reduce their embodied carbon impacts. When individual government agencies look at the greenhouse gas impacts of their operations, they typically follow the same system as corporations and businesses do using the greenhouse gas protocol as a measurement system. This system assesses emissions based on scope one, two, and three. Scope one emissions are from an organization's operations that are under a facility's direct control, things like on-site fuel combustion. Scope two emissions are from the usage of electricity, steam, or heat purchased from third parties. Scope three emissions are upstream and downstream value chain emissions including upstream supply chain emissions from purchased products, transport emissions and business travel, and downstream emissions from the transport of products, usage of sold products, and product disposal. So when we talk about embodied carbon emissions for building materials, those purchases would show up in scope three emissions for governments. Let's take a closer look at this accounting framework for the Washington Department of Transportation. Here are the results of the greenhouse gas inventory CLF conducted for WashDOT that was published in April, 2023. The results show that on average, the scope three emissions, which include the embodied carbon impacts of their building material purchases, comprise over 50% of the agency's greenhouse gas emissions. 
This has helped Watchdot focus their climate actions on those areas with the most impacts. Overall, this is a pretty common story for state and local agencies. We often see that construction spending comprises over 50% of the agency's impacts. I encourage you to check out this report to explore all the different embodied carbon reduction strategies identified for WashDOT. Most of them will apply to any state or local DOT, not just WashDOT. We're going to wrap up here by talking about how embodied carbon shows up in community-based greenhouse gas inventories. There are two primary types of inventories, production-based, also known as territorial or sector-based, and consumption-based inventories. The key difference between these types of inventories is whether you're counting up emissions that are produced within a regional boundary versus consumed within your regional boundary. When we're talking about embodied carbon, it's important to look at reduction strategies through the lens of both production and consumption-based emissions. Production-based emissions are often those manufacturing facilities that a state typically has regulatory control over. However, not all building materials consumed within a state are typically produced within that same state. Let's take a closer look at the state of Oregon, who is the only state we're aware of that has developed both a production and consumption-based greenhouse gas inventory. The first thing we notice is that in Oregon, their production-based inventory is smaller than their consumption-based inventory. We also see that embodied carbon is hard to identify within the production-based inventory. It's spread out through a bunch of different sectors on the left. However, in the consumption-based inventory, the embodied carbon of building materials is clearly identified as an end-use sector and comprises 8% of all statewide emissions. Consumption-based greenhouse gas inventories are typically based on spending data that combine dollars spent in any given sector with the greenhouse gas emissions from that same sector. This method, called economic input-output lifecycle assessment, is an excellent way to identify and prioritize the relative importance of embodied carbon compared to other community-based impact sectors. However, this measurement approach is less sensitive to measuring short-term changes in greenhouse gas emissions due to the time lag in producing these data sets and its heavy reliance on economic prices versus directly measured emissions. Let's look at one more example on the local level in Washington state. Here's the consumption-based emissions inventory of an average household in King County, Washington. In the housing impacts category, we see that the provision of shelter comprised about 18% of all housing-related impacts. It's important to note that these impacts are just for residential households and not for non-residential buildings or government spending. Overall, the point here is to provide a simple introduction to some of the measurement approaches at a community, government, and business level before we dive into the detailed measurement approaches for embodied carbon covered in modules two, three, and four of this training series. There are lots of additional resources on the CLF website, including policy toolkits, research reports, and ways to connect with others interested in reducing embodied carbon. In particular, if you work on infrastructure projects more than building projects, I suggest you check out the Embodied Carbon Toolkit for Roadway Infrastructure, where we provide an introduction, accounting overview, and detailed list of reduction strategies for infrastructure projects. Thank you for attending this module, and make sure to check out the other videos in this training series.